in this particular case, I wanted to, uh, I went in a little um, backwards because I, I was seduced into doing this by Bill Lawrence because I didn't want to work because I was, I was just doing a film every once in a while, like 42, and I was kind of bouncing around like that. I've done enough TV for a lifetime. And then Billy kind of talked me into it. And then it seemed like one of the main objectives was to make, create as much distance between myself and Dr. Cox, which in some circles is a pretty iconic TV character. And I didn't want to fall into the trap of, of living in his shadow in any way. And so I started to think about the voice a lot. It's interesting to say that. And having just come off playing Red Barber in 42, I um, indulged myself a great deal in, in voice work with Red. And so here, I. I made a cocktail out of um, out of uh, George Scott and uh, Lee J. Cobb and uh, Jason Robarts, and uh, I, I kind of mixed those together, and I found Mansfield's voice somewhere in there. And it's funny during the first during the pilot, uh, some people from Turner came to me and asked me if I had a cold. And of course, I didn't have a cold. I was playing at this voice and and trying to own it and finding the different and calibrating it. Uh, to, to where I want it. Now it's now it's where I, now it's where I want it. That doesn't necessarily address your questions about other commanding roles, but it, it certainly is germane to this one. It seems like the takeaway uh, so far, eight episodes into this, is that unlike doing a Broadway play or a film or a, a single cam, the more agile you can stay between your ears, the better you are served. And what I mean is that. Uh, if you're doing a David Madden play, you really want to commit to David's words. If you're doing an Oliver Stone film, you want to commit to what Oliver's put on the page. Here, if you make the mistake of committing to the words too early, it's going to be an exercise in frustration because you will be given draft after draft after draft of rewrites. And that can't be a problem. It has to be a privilege. And so unless you're willing to embrace being that nimble cerebrally, you're dead. This is my first series regular part, so I was just really excited about you know being on TV working with Bill Lawrence. Um, I'm also in the writer's room as a story editor, and uh, that gave us an opportunity to uh, sort of figure out what was funny about me and maybe slip a little of that into the character. And um, there ended up being a lot of stuff that were um, fairly aligned. Uh, you know, this kid loves sneakers and he loves trying on uh, this thing that is he thinks is cool and he's not great at it, and I definitely identify with that. As, uh, as somebody that just had that ugly duckling phase and is now trying to figure out how to not be that duckling. Yeah, I get, I get this guy. It's been fun. I fit in both because I've certainly worked in both. And so, uh, where, wherever the gig is, I mean, most actors, you plug them in, they flourish. And so, I, I could easily do both. I have them both. Yeah. Uh, I'd say both as well. I, uh, I was a high school teacher before I got into comedy. And uh, I think that was uh, I think that was a good experience for me. It informed a lot of my of my creative choices. And I uh, yeah. Finley is uh, an incredible prof professional, and he came with a game that I uh, had never seen before on the pilot. Um, and so I immediately was drawn uh, to to everything that he was bringing to the table, and uh, so I immediately use that into, in the 3 beat. I just threw that right in the 3 beat because um, the guy's ice cold. He comes on take one and he's got like all these great choices and he's giving you so much and if you aren't you know, delivering on the, on the other end of that, uh, it's a terrible feeling. Though. But when you are and things are, are banging, it feels great. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I love working with this guy. Well, no one's my peer, it's my company. Right. And so, <laughs> We find out in the pilot I only work two days a week, so uh, in the context of the story, and so the, it doesn't mean peers. The missing piece is that, uh, and, and what's very attractive to me is that he wants uh, Skyler's character to be his son. Uh, it's a guy who has a missing piece, and that kind of um, damage and, and, and that kind of uh, loss or yearning, I, I think, is very that the writers can write for it and the actors can play it. As uh, my relationship to Rene is, he's an employee, and I think I'm mildly amused by him. And but like all the employees, for now they're all expendable. Ah, good question. <laughs> um, the high school students, absolutely. Yeah, they didn't sign up to show up. 
they <laughs> were forced to be there. And um, you know, they've got you know a 15 minute uh, recess break and a 45 minute lunch break to look forward to. Uh, so it's really tough to <laughs> to follow that. Yes, I wrote uh, episode 107 with my writing partner, Joel Church Cooper, and we shot that two weeks ago. And when you say, you mentioned that you were learning if there was some funny stuff that you could incorporate into your character, right. you know, when you're in the writer's room, does that just mean you incorporate whatever the writers make fun of you for in the writer's room? Uh, pretty much. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a guy that struggled with uh, uh, his haircuts for the majority of my life, and uh, because I've got terrible hair and it takes a lot of work to get it to go, this way, uh, and you know that those are those are things that a writers room are going to pick up on and, and find a way to get into the script. Um, you know, little, little things like that. Yeah. Well, what I what what I articulate, what the writers let me articulate in the pilot, uh, I I I can understand, but completely reject, and that is that there's there's two approaches to leading one's life financially, and that's to either work. 90 hours a week until you're 40 and then maybe you have an outside shot at, at having the kind of financial freedom and being able to do what you want for the rest of your life. Or, as Briga's character articulates, you can uh, get off every day at five and, uh, and, and live in the now. But like all the pensioners in Detroit, have nothing when you're 65. And so the show doesn't pretend to have the right answer to that uh, since both sides are, are presented uh, pretty fairly. But I would say that the one thing that Mansfield gets to learn from the people at the ground floor is that that's complete and utter bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because I'm so fond of almost everybody in this thing, uh, I'd, love, I'd love to do it for, for another five or six years. I mean, Scrubs we did for nine years, and that it's folly to, to hope for that, um, since the Vegas odds are so long. But, uh, I'd love to do this for five or six years with this group. It's a really extraordinary young group. I could do four of those. <laughs> <laughs>